I was born in 1985 in Singapore, so I'll likely live up to 74. But what if I could increase it by 30 years? What if I want to escape death by another... 50 years? 100 years? If my body is my temple, could I get inside to fix it up every now and then so that it never collapses on me? Is there a pill I could take to simply stop growing old and weak? If my heart starts to fail... Can I have a new one made just for me? Or inject cells into me so that my body can rejuvenate from the inside out? Or maybe just dispense with my biological body altogether and just transfer my consciousness into something indestructible. Science fiction or just science. In this episode of Why It Matters, I'm looking to find out if I can cheat death. How long will I live? I think that's something that we've all asked ourselves at some point in our lives. Maybe a bit more so in the past year. The oldest person to have ever lived on record is French woman Jeanne Calmont. She lived for 122 years and 164 days. <laughs> hmm, can I break Jean Calmont's record of 122 years? In the 1800s, the global average life expectancy was 30. 200 years later, today, it's risen to 72. So does this mean that we're living twice as long as our ancestors? Not exactly. This big jump in life expectancy is mostly because we've managed to stop a lot of babies and kids from dying. Thanks to advances in public hygiene, nutrition, and medicine. So when we talk about the average number of years one can expect to live, bring down child and infant mortality and the average goes up. So while life expectancy has increased over the last 200 years, lifespan, not so much. <laughs> lifespan is the maximum number of years humans or any species can expect to live. Some of the longest living creatures are found in the ocean. One deep-sea sponge has been found to have lived for at least 11,000 years. A sponge. And this creature, a jellyfish species known as Turritopsis dornii, is actually immortal. So, compared to some creatures, our common lifespan of 122 years is pretty short. Does that mean that there's room to extend it? To extend our lifespan, Professor Brian Kennedy and his team have been looking at ways to slow aging. And they are starting with finding better methods to determine how old our bodies really are. In other words, our biological age, which is different from our actual age. Why do we need to know our biological age? So if you're 36, mm -hmm. but in reality, you're 45 biologically, that means you're not aging very well. Mm -hmm. So with biomarkers, is identify people that are not aging well, mm -hmm. and then help them with lifestyle interventions that will turn that number back down toward normal. Uh, and then the other thing is, if we have an intervention we want to test, like a drug or a supplement, we need some way to show it's working. How do you even identify biomarkers in the first place? So there are different kinds of biomarkers that have been tested. Physiologic markers like pulse wave velocity. And then there are markers of sort of activity that work very well in the elderly population, like how far you can walk in six minutes. And then there are factors in your blood. More recently, people have used very deep data sets in thousands of individuals 
and artificial intelligence and just let computers try to optimize age prediction based on thousands of different data points. Mm -hmm. And that's led to these new age sort of biologic aging markers like the DNA methylation clock and mm -hmm. measuring your age from facial patterns. Oh, wow. Uh, so uh, that, these are not fully validated yet with uh, the FDA, uh, but uh, there's a lot of data that they predict the onset of diseases and they predict mortality to some extent as well. I'd like to know what my biological age is, so I've offered myself as guinea pig. We'll take a, a different views of your face, reconstruct your three-dimensional facial image, and use that to measure your biologic age. How does it work? Well, so it measures like 41 different parameters, and so one of them is mouth slant. And so you might notice that young people tend to smile more. When you get older, the facial slope goes like this, and that's muscles in your face that control how your lips are or that. So a lot of times really old people have trouble smiling and so that's one of the ones that turns out to matter. Okay, this is my moment of reckoning. Wow, my biological age is older than my chronological age. But how does knowing my biological age help me live longer? According to the World Bank, our life expectancy in Singapore is 83, one of the highest in the world. But we also spend a lot of money on taking care of the elderly. One report estimates that annual elderly healthcare costs will be over 50,000 Singapore dollars per capita by 2030, the highest in Asia Pacific. But what if we could grow chronologically older without growing biologically older? I've just learned that what I've lived for 36 years, my biological age is different. I am biologically older than my chronological age. So the question is, can I reverse that? Sean Lim thinks I can. He started Regenosis in 2016 a one-stop shop for the average Singaporean looking to reverse ageing. There are many things today you can do to reverse ageing, whether it be interventions, supplements, uh, therapies that are medically proven and safe. These are very nice things to have, but I'm sure they're going to cost an arm and a leg. Mm, no. For example, that is a supplement uh, called alpha ketoglutarate, short form AKG. Your body manufactures AKG. It's something that your body uses for your cell energy transport, as well as uh, a lot of cell functions. But to get older, you generate less and less of that. And you cannot supplement this from anything else. Taking these supplements for people between 55 to 65, averagely it reduces seven years of biological age within six months of taking this. So how much does a supplement like that cost? $150, Singapore dollars, for, for a month supply. Okay, and then this is just one of the, the many different things that... Yes, this is yes. Just one of the many different things you can do. So we try to map out the body as much as possible. We'll do a very comprehensive DNA test, over 5,000 genes examined. We will do a very comprehensive blood test to get an idea of what is the nutrition level. And then we'll look at different ways to see where you're doing wrong. For example, if you're eating wrongly. Apparently, I need to limit my caffeine intake. So instead of having coffee, I'm having hot chocolate this morning. Smells good. Based on my body composition, I've been told to eat only 1,600 calories a day. And I've been given meal suggestions close to what I like to eat to achieve just that. And it's not just how much we eat, but also what and when. In my personalised meal plan, 
I am being asked to get most of my calories from fats rather than carbohydrates or proteins. And I'm only allowed to eat in an 8-hour window in the day. The rest of the day, I fast. Studies have shown that fasting helps stem cells regenerate. And stem cells are the raw materials from which all our other cells are made to repair or replace damaged cells in our bodies. A renewal process that's a lot faster than it seems. Every five days, our gut lining is completely overhauled. Every three weeks, our skin cells are replaced. And every 10 years, our bones are regenerated. But as we get older, it gets harder and harder for the body to keep fixing itself. And the big reason for this is because we have fewer and fewer functional stem cells as we age. And stem cells are critical for healing damage inside the body. Back in the 1990s, scientists managed to figure out a way to extract stem cells from human embryos and grow them in a lab. And in the early 2000s, they even managed to turn regular adult cells into stem cells. Does this mean we can keep replenishing our stem cell supply and keep aging at bay? To find out, I'm talking to this man. Dr. Freddy Teo started Singapore's first private stem cell bank in 2015. Dr. Teo, how can we use stem cells to fight aging? We call it regenerative therapy. If you look in the animal world, Animals like the salamander, they don't die. When you cut off a limb, they regrow. Yeah. That's because they got a lot of stem cells, so they can do that. For some reason, the human being after evolution have lost that capability. Uh, okay, stem cells aren't new. I mean, we've known about them for decades, right? So why is it only now that we're starting to see or even take steps to have results? Because we're not even seeing the results yet. In the past, we can only harvest whatever that is available in the body. Mm -hmm. Now it's different. Now we can actually grow the stem cells in the laboratory. There is a, a known example where this patient has got a cancer in the trachea. If they remove it, the patient cannot breathe anymore. They actually uh, grew that part of the airway in the laboratory, removed the, the, the cancerous part and regrow it back in. So it's literally like the changing a tire. Besides the loss of stem cells which help us heal inside, there's another driver of ageing. We gain senescent cells. As we get older, more and more of our cells become senescent. They stop dividing and supporting the organs and tissues they're in. So they are not alive, but not quite dead either. They send chemical signals to make the cells around them enter this zombie state. These zombie cells prevent tissue repair, cause chronic inflammation, and drive our bodies to age and break down. The question is, can we kill these zombie cells before they kill us? As we grow older, some of our cells become senescent, a zombie state where they stop dividing. And the theory is, removing them could stop aging. Using CRISPR, scientists in China just found the gene that causes cells to become senescent, CAT7. Is cutting this gene out the panacea to aging? I'm checking in with Professor Tan Minghao at NTU. As someone who just developed a test that uses CRISPR to detect COVID-19 in patients, he should know if we are on the path to editing aging out of our DNA. So, Prof, uh, the CAT7 gene, now, if we target it and cut it out, does that mean we can reverse or stop aging? 
So the Cat7 gene is like a brick that tells the cells not to grow. So then you can uh, you get rid of Cat7, uh, you basically remove the brick, but then this brick protein uh, is also a well-known uh, tumor suppressor gene, so it causes cancer if you get rid of it. Oh, so not so safe to just cut it yet. So I got a bit excited, a bit too early for nothing. <laughs> Well, uh, not not really. I mean, it could it could very well be a, a, a bona fide target, uh, and it and it's also very much dependent on let's say who you are trying to treat, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you are uh, dealing with elderly people, mm -hmm. uh, and you know they, they don't have much time to live anymore, mm -hmm. right? So then, okay, you knock out cat seven, and then the elderly people get to live a few more years and enjoy a few more years of life. Mm -hmm. um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I see. So it might be beneficial for someone who is already reaching the end of their life. If you get a few more years, you do. Um, but if you get cancer, well, in a way, you're sort of the end of your life, <laughs> reaching the end of your life. Exactly. Anyway. Exactly. That's that's the that's the kind of the logic behind okay. behind it, right? It's either you have an, a few extra years or not at all. Ah, so right. why not have a few extra years? So from what I understand, it feels like CRISPR is not at that stage to help us confidently to fight aging. There's definitely a lot of work that still needs to be done. Hmm, at that rate, I'd be over 50 before I see the light at the end of the tunnel for a solution to kill my zombie cells. Perhaps I should be heading in a different direction? You don't have to be a science fiction nerd to be familiar with the idea that sometime in the future, we may be able to upload our brain into a computer and live forever in a simulation. Now, stories with such ideas have been told since the 1930s. I didn't realise that computers existed even then. But what would it take to scan our brains? Imagine, scientists have seen uncanny similarities between our brain neuronal network and the web of galaxies in the universe. Currently, we know there are at least 100 billion galaxies out there. The human brain, on the other hand, has 86 billion neurons, give or take. Yes, our neurons are almost as numerous as the galaxies. How on earth are we going to map 86 billion neurons and the trillions of synapses between them into a computer. But researchers are rising to the challenge. They have already scanned the 25,000 neurons in the brain of a fruit fly. And now, over 1,000 scientists across Asia Pacific are working together to map the human brain in 3D by 2024. And this is the guy who got the ball rolling. Associate Professor Lo Chen Ming from NUS co-founded Synapse, a partnership of over 40 institutions to use a strategy of divide and conquer to create the first map of the human brain. So Professor, um, where are we and, and what's all this? It is the first and only synchrotron facility in Singapore. Well, what is a synchrotron? A well, synchrotron is actually a ring. You can imagine it's a ring. You generate a high energy X-ray. And this energy uh, is able to have uh, deep penetration into samples. Mm -hmm. And that is important for uh, imaging of the human brain where we need the high resolution. Okay, so you're saying like this is just a super duper powerful X-ray machine? Yes, indeed. Uh, a typical CT scan or X-ray is able to achieve a resolution of maybe one to two thickness of the hair or the diameter of the hair. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about 0.1 millimeter. Okay. Here we are talking about 0 0.0003 millimeter. That wow. is 300 times smaller. We are now on track to be able to scan the whole human brain, make an X-ray of the whole brain. Yes, uh, the technology called Exxon is on track. So uh, speed is no longer an issue. Having said that, currently the storage uh, is a big challenge. Mm -hmm. We estimated the volume of data that is generated from imaging one human brain exceeds one exabyte, one million or one terabyte. I mean, one terabyte disk already to me is like a lot. Now you're telling me I need one million of these. How do we do that? So by cut and conquer strategy, 
uh, we are able to take one human brain and perhaps certain parts of the brain imaged by certain partner countries. Data will be stored and processed in that particular country high performance computing center. Mm -hmm. What will be uh, agreed to store in Singapore will be the bare uh, information to create a skeletal map. Uh, then when can we start to do that for the human? Okay, we need a donor. So we need a donor brain to be able to be stained, then to be able to process and image. Okay, so this sounds really exciting right now. Like if, if we can fully map the human brain, does that mean that, like for myself, map my brain, store it in a computer somewhere, and years down the road, be able to take it and put it into an inorganic body, and I can sort of live again? Answer is no. From the scientific perspective, uh, generating a map is possible. Uh -huh. Right. Whether the map uh, represents uh, your memory, your experiences, uh, that requires validation. We have been looking to live forever since, well, forever. More than 4,000 years ago, King Gilgamesh of Mesopotamia, one of the oldest civilizations in the world, looked for the elixir of life because he didn't want to die. Over 2,000 years ago, China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, ordered a search for a potion that would help prolong his life. Ironically, he didn't even see past 40 because he took cinnabar, which contains mercury, to try and cheat death. And in 16th century France, nobles drank gold in the hopes that it would keep them young. Fast forward five centuries, we now understand how our bodies age far better than ever before. It looks like the idea of us escaping the impact of old age on our bodies may not just be a science fiction trope. It seems not to be just a matter of if, but when. It reminds me of the ship of Theseus. It's an age-old thought experiment that asks this question. Now, if a ship's parts get replaced one by one until eventually all its parts get replaced, is it still the same ship? If I replace every part of me, as and when it wears out, would I still be the same person? You know, with scientists all over the world working on trying to cheat death, we may just get a chance to find out. And that's why it matters.